Vinny, I hope you're having a great Friday, man. Welcome into the game in Tuscaloosa. I appreciate you having, uh, for having me on, guys. Yeah, no doubt, man. I, I cannot wait to kind of pick your brain. Uh, this Georgia-Florida game is is the national game that the eyes of college football are going to be up on Jacksonville, Florida on Saturday afternoon at 2.30. You know, it's it's the game of the week. It's the game to kind of decide which which team coming from the East is going to be able to go to the SEC championship. There's a lot of implications on the line. If Georgia wants an opportunity to face Alabama again and try and prove that they are the team in the SEC, they got to win this football game. Vinny, what, what do you think this game comes down to? I think it comes down to uh, which quarterback makes the least amount of mistakes. Uh, Felipe Franks and Jake Fromm are the I think both defenses are very similar. I think they both throw a lot at both these quarterbacks and see how they handle it. I think whoever makes the least amount of mistakes and manages the game the best, it will uh, give their team the best opportunity to have success and win the football game. I mean, think about the, the year number one here with Dan Mullen, that he's taken a team that is in, in position. Now, they would need some help from Kentucky. Kentucky would have to lose. You know, you'd beat Georgia and hopefully either Missouri or uh, the, the Georgia would turn around and beat Kentucky because Georgia's got that tiebreaker. Uh, but Florida's in a position that they're in the conversation to go to Atlanta. You know, it's, it completely changed from what everybody thought was going to happen this year with the University of Florida. Dan Bullen came in there and completely changed that program around in one year. Um, it's something similar to what Kirby was able to do when he got to Georgia and very similar to what Coach Saban was able to do when he got to Alabama. And I think a lot of people are going to take notice of that. And I think a lot of people are understanding that it's not just the offense, it's the defense also that's giving them a lot of success uh, covering up some of the weaknesses on the offensive side of the football for Florida. What do you think uh, practice has been like? Because when you lose, you want to go right back on the field as quick as you possibly can. For Georgia, they've had to sit around and kind of lick their wounds for two weeks after losing to the uh, Tigers down in Baton Rouge. You know, everybody asked how I felt about Alabama to play well, and you had a lot of confidence going into your bye week. That gives you a sense of security as you're off. You can kind of relax, unwind, go back and analyze everything and kind of have an open mind. And all George has been able to do is focus on is that LSU loss. And that's been in their head for the last two weeks, and it can either pay dividends for them. They can come out very hungry, uh, very determined, very focused and refined, or they can let that LSU loss linger and they can have some um, continued bumps in the road and Trump can continue to struggle. So it kind of we'll, we'll see which team comes out on the field on Saturday. But, Vinny, we had questions about Georgia going to Baton Rouge, and I know what you and I talked about them, uh, that, that there were some areas that did not look like 2017 dogs that had that amazing run. I mean, th- there was there was a big difference between last year's team and this year's team in Athens. You know, they're missing Roquan Smith, they're missing Tony Michelle, and they're uh, missing their big offensive tackle that they had last year that they were all first-round draft picks, and I think that was all prevalent in the LSU loss. The offensive side of the ball, they were able to run, but they weren't able to run as effective or give from the amount of time that they had in 2017. And defensively, they look a little lethargic. They're making mental mistakes, and they're just not playing to the caliber of a Kirby smart coach defense. Now, if you were Kirby, would you stick with Jake Fromm, or, or do you, you try to bring in Justin Fields? You know, it's a feel thing, and nobody feels or understands that team better than Kirby Smart. Um, I think you allowed uh, Jake Fromm because what he's been able to do thus far this year and uh, last year, you give him the opportunity to come into the football game, but he has a short leash. leash. Uh, you have to give him the opportunity to have success, give him drives, let him gain confidence and composure and gain a rhythm with these wide receivers. But if it is one of those games where in the first quarter Florida's up big and they're struggling, I do think you see a lot of Justin Fields. Vinny, I'm hearing some great things about practice this week, that it wasn't just a bye week in Tuscaloosa. It was a week, an opportunity to get better. Nick Saban sort of set that tone, and I think the players grabbed it. I'm hearing some great energy uh, from practice. That it, I know they didn't have an opponent this week, uh, but they used the three practices this week to get better and, and to clean up some of their mistakes. You know, this is, this is very typical of a Nick Saban off week. You go back and you refine everything that you did during camp and kind of got last and days ago on during the season, you go back and you study yourself and you see what plays the teams have success against us, what situations did we not do as well, and you refine those things. And that's what Coach Saban does every single bye week. And if you had a couple mental lapses, if, you, if a team had a successful play against you, more likely teams later on in the year will try and mimic that by disguising it by different formations and presenting it a different way. But whenever you go back and look at it and see those plays during the game, whenever it presents itself in front of you, you feel much more comfortable and you think you can have a lot more success uh, being on the football field at that time compared to earlier on in the year. 
Vinny, how much of this time during this bye week when you've got a little bit more time that you can spend self-scouting, making sure you're not tipping things off and how other teams will try to attack you? Because, you know, Dave Aranda is one of the best in the business, man. He's going to throw some things that maybe Tua has not seen and, and maybe – uh, maybe that's where all these great analysts come into come into play of, of kind of saying, okay, this is a big self scout week. Yeah, it is a very big self scout week, and a lot of what Coach David tells each position coach to do is pick out a certain number of plays that they deem are trust like w- willing to learn from, and plays that they tip to, if, whether the safety was going to the middle of the field, whether the safety was playing split safety, whether the safety was coming down to play some kind of man coverage. It's, there's a lot of opportunities to self-scout. And each uh, position coach usually picks probably 10 to 15 plays to show their players so that during the during the game they can understand and kind of refer back to, okay, I want, every single time I had my front foot up, I was coming down in the box. Well, let's make sure that I kind of stagger my stance a little bit. I don't tip it off as easily. If, if, if my feet are uh, parallel, then we're going back and playing cover too. So you just got to self-scout those things and kind of nitpick little things because that's what quarterbacks – and defensive backs look for on the football field. Benny, we have also spent the first uh, part of this week going back and looking at these eight games. I mean, these the stats around this offense, you were so high on this offense during the offseason. You were one of the first people uh, who came on this program and said that you expect this. But did you expect this? I mean, be honest with me. Be, be honest. Alabama's number one in the country uh, in total offense – number one in scoring, number one in total yards. I mean, we're not accustomed to this. Did you really expect that this offense would be this good? You know, I had a lot of expectations for this Alabama football team, and I had a lot of expectations for Tua. And at some times I thought maybe he's not going to be able to live up to the hype. Maybe he's not going to be as great as everybody, including myself, had said that he could possibly be coming in and doing what he was able to do in the national championship. And then he goes and does and beyond and then surpasses what we thought he could possibly do. The kid is having a career year. And uh, one of those careers that back in the, in probably 20 to 30 years from now, they're going to be making 30 for 30s on him, saying how great he was, how great this Nick Saban decision was to bring him in the national championship, how bringing him in the national championship saved Nick Saban five more years as a top dog in the SEC because of you Kirby Smart had nothing to lose, and Nick Saban had everything to lose in that football game. Uh, Nick Saban loses that game. Uh, commits start going to Georgia. They start doing different things. Georgia's now the top dog. Coach Saban's older. People start wondering if he's on his way out. But he goes in and wins that football game. Then he comes here, and he has 25 touchdowns and no interceptions, 2,000 yards through eight football games. I mean, I'm ready to hand the Heisman Trophy to the kid right now. Um, I think he's going to continue to perform and continue to do what he's continued to do and be very humble, and I think he has a lot of success. You mentioned it just a couple of seconds ago when you talk about handing the torch. Uh, you know, if Kirby Smart wins that championship game, can you think of the conversations that we're having here in Tuscaloosa? I mean, I, I know it's, you know, hypothetical, but, you know, we're, we're probably saying, you know, two championships in a row. I mean, we're probably questioning, you know, does Coach Saban kind of let it slipping a little bit? I mean, I mean, think about the, 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 the conversations that we would be having if Kirby Smart is able to continue and, uh, that game goes the second half like it did the first half. You know, <laughs> it really would be very interesting to think about it. But, you know, he went into that football game and won. And that's why Coach David is so great. Because not only do the people expect him to get to the national championship, they expect him to win the national championship every year. And what he's been able to do at the University of Alabama is nothing but short of unbelievable. I think people that even consider – Auburn Bryant in the same conversation as Coach David still, I think, is almost comical because the saturation of college football compared to now, uh, compared to how it was back then, is nothing compared to how it is now. Uh, all the recruiting, all the uh, social media, all the distractions. Bear, Bear Bryant, you knew his name, and you knew the University of Alabama, and that's where you went to school, and they had the best talent, and no bar, and nobody could compete with them. Now you have LSU, Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, Ohio State. Penn State, USC, you have all these great colleges that are competing with Alabama and doing things uh, to try and compete with and uh, bring players to their programs, and it's a lot tougher. And What Coach Davis is able to do is unbelievable. You know, here's the question. When we look at SEC scoring offense, Alabama's clearly they're the number one team in college football, which makes them uh, obviously number one in, in, in the SEC. But if you just take their first-half stats – 
and you just say scoring points in the first half, Alabama second, two tenths of a point behind Georgia when you just compare the first half. I mean, these numbers that we're going to continue, and oh yeah, by the way, we haven't even reached the month of November. I mean, there's going to be some major records that are going to be falling in the Southeastern Conference from this Alabama team if they continue at this pace. You know, there's going to be a lot of records broken, and I think this kid and what he's been able to do to a tongue of Viola, if he continues to be humble and continues to work and doesn't have an off year, I think you finally see a back-to-back Heisman Trophy winner. Uh, there's a lot of expectations. There's a lot of pressure on this kid, but he's lived up to all the hype and he's handled all the pressure uh, pretty unbelievably. Vinny, let's stop here and we'll come back. We'll talk a couple of other games, but uh, let me throw it out. Let me throw it back to you and talk about this first segment sponsor as Vinny joins us each and every Friday and Monday to break down college football and give us a preview for the weekend. Watch the tire roll at rounders across from Publix on the Strip with their 11 by 17 foot big screen TV, over 50 varieties of beers, 30-plus television, Rounders is the place to be on game day. After the game, celebrate with a great game day view of Bryant Denny Stadium on the rooftop, live music downstairs, and their Vegas-inspired boom, boom, boom. Keep the party going on Rounders, or on Instagram and Twitter, at Rounders UA, or at Rounders Bar on Snapchat. Now, Vinny, you got to set the DVR tonight. Uh, if you're not going to be at home, 7 o'clock, when one of the biggest high school football games in the country is about 45 minutes north uh, Marquise and I are going to be going. It's Coach Bryant's grandson, Paul Tyson, which is already committed to the University of Alabama, and then to his younger brother, Talia Tungavaloa. Uh, both of these young men are going to be playing 7 o'clock Thompson against Hewitt Trustful. This is a big-time football game. you got to DVR this one and uh, give us some thoughts on Monday. You know, I I didn't even know uh, Coach Bryant's son was committed to um I think it's going to be a good football game, like you said. Hey, it, it, Everybody's been praising to his, uh, to his brother and has been really astonished by how he's been able to play the game of football so far. But, you know, there's a big difference between going from co- high school to college and obviously to has proven that he's been able to do it. But, you know, there's a lot. There's a big step to take. Well, and, and, and this young man, uh, Talia Tungavaloa, he's thrown for 12,000 yards in, in his high school career. I mean, I mean, that just kind of puts things into perspective. I mean, 12,000 uh, yards. Uh, Nick Saban may never have to worry about quarterbacks uh, here in Tuscaloosa. You know, Coach Saban might not have to worry about a quarterback until he's uh, he's ready to <laughs> ride off into the sunset with the uh, some of the Ola brothers. But uh, I think it's uh, Alabama is in good hands for the next couple uh, years in uh, at the quarterback position. All right, Vinny, we we've already talked about Florida and Georgia. Is there something else in college football that grabs you that? that say, you know, i, I got to make an appointment to make sure I watch this game? Like you said, the Texas-Oklahoma State game. Um, Texas is pretty evenly matched against Oklahoma State uh, every, in everything except the record book. Oklahoma State has a better offense. Their defense is competing and playing at a high level. And I think that if they can get this quarterback to make a couple mistakes, uh, Ellinger, uh, I, think, I think it could be one of those games we were talking about on Monday that – Texas just knocked themselves out of the college football ranking and won't be able to do enough to find their way back in. The other team that I think is at risk of falling just like Texas is Kentucky. They're the number 12 team. They're going up against a Missouri team that has Drew Locke, that has shown the ability to move the football, that has shown the ability to score a lot of points. And a lot of Kentucky's games are low-scoring wins. So uh, there's going to be an opportunity for a couple upsets in college football, and I think it's going to shake up how the college football committee lays out that first round. Yeah, let me ask you, when you look at four teams in college football, from your eyes, how would you, because Tuesday will be college football playoff rankings, but just going into this final uh, weekend before college football playoff rankings are released, how would you look at the best four teams in college football? How, how does Vinny have them stacking up? You know, the only way – you can do it is if you give two SEC schools in there. I, I think I know I'm a little biased because of it, but I just think the SEC is the best conference in college football. My top, my top four right now would be Alabama, Clemson, Notre Dame, and the winner of the Florida Georgia game right now, allowing the Kentucky Georgia game to play a big dividend. Because if Florida beats Georgia and Kentucky beats uh, Georgia pretty handily, then I think that knocks Georgia's or at Florida's win over Georgia down a little bit and gives the Big Ten another opportunity to find its way into the college football playoff. 
All right, final question here. We're talking to Vinny, and and we're going to wrap things up as we look ahead next week. And and I know we'll talk about it next Monday and Friday, but we've got some nervous anxiety here in Tuscaloosa with LSU. Should we be nervous about this game? Of course. It's a college football game at night in Tiger Stadium, and anything can happen in Tiger Stadium on Saturday night. Uh, This is a game that Alabama has been wanting. Everybody wants Alabama to get tested. Everybody wants to see what Tua Tungavola is all about and what this offense is all about and to see if it's fully golden or if it's gold-plated and to see if this offense can continue to put up points. Um, I think they have a lot of preparation preparation ahead of them. I think they need to prepare Sunday through Friday to have success on Saturday. So we'll see, but everybody, I'm excited to see how this Alabama team performs in Louisiana. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are, and and, and certainly, I mean, listen, LSU, I mean, you you step back just for a couple of minutes and you look at a top four team, I don't think anybody had LSU in the top five going into the month of November. What Coach Orgeron's been able to do is nothing short of uh, exceptional. It's it's exactly what Dan Mullen's been able to do at Florida. Not a lot of people thought that these two programs would be in the top rankings of the SEC and competing for an SEC West and an SEC East. Uh, division title. So uh, I think both these guys need a round of applause, and I'm kind of curious to see who comes out with the Coach of the Year award. Hey, Vinny, we'll have a lot of things to wrap up. Let's talk about Camellia Place, man. Tell us more. The second sponsor is Camellia Place Luxury Condos. With their gorgeous New York-inspired and styled amenities, great locations being steps away from Coleman Coliseum and Bryant Denny Stadium, developed by the same builder who built the Chimes and Champions Place in the heart of Tuscaloosa. Check out Camellia Place at www.camelliaplace.com and you'll find yourself at the spot for Tuscaloosa game day luxury living. Hey, Vinny, have a great weekend, man, and enjoy some great college football, and we'll talk to you Monday. Appreciate you guys. You get to relax this weekend. There can't be an Alabama loss. Yeah, we're just we're, – but now you got to watch Auburn and Open University, man. That, that That's going to be a close game. I don't know if their offense can handle Open. <laughs> we'll see what happens. It's uh, – it's going to be a fun weekend for college football.